It is another TFIF on video. I'm Ross. Thanks for joining me. Uh, in this week, in their homes, in their hot seats, we have Craig Marias. Hello, Craig. Hello, hello. We've got Kishnan, bottom left of my screen at the moment. I don't know where he's going to turn up on yours. 19 unbeaten run. <laughs> he sounds like all I'm going to say, Ross. <laughs> uh, Bob Holmes is also here. Hello, Bob. Hi, I detect a gloat there, Keisha. <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, as usual, we'll look back on the EPL and it's nearing the end, guys. Match week 36 happened uh, over the week and I guess the shock result was Arsenal 2, Liverpool 1. Uh, Craig, Liverpool's hopes of setting this new Premier League record ended with their third defeat of the season. Yeah, um, it's a shame, you know, because they, they've been absolutely fantastic, as we, we've said countless times um, on the show. Um, and, you know, there was a real possibility, you know, post-lockdown that they'll be able to, to hit, I think it was 109 points uh, that, that they targeted to, to, to get the record. Um, you, uh, you know, I think with this, you've got to give Arsenal a lot of credit. Uh, I thought, you know, from the start that they had in the match, um, as the game wore on, um, they they settled a little bit better. I think Liverpool were the better team at the start and, and deservedly took the lead. But um, but Arsenal came, came into it, and yes, you know you look back and you can say yeah they they capitalised on individual errors uh, first from Van Dijk and then from Allison. Um, but w would you have said that Arsenal of old would have done that? You know, I, I I've been watching Arsenal the last few weeks, and you can see there is. Um, a new identity coming mm. into their play with, with Mickey Arteta. Okay. Um, I think he's been he's he's been good for the club. It's been a great appointment. Um, uh, but but with Liverpool, it's what we expected really. Um, as soon as they got you know the points for the title, they've they've kind of taken the foot off the pedal. Um, and and you know it was expected. I don't think anyone here um, thought that they'd be able to go on this this kind of run. You know this the run that they'd be going on post lock. Uh, pre-lockdown um, and, and stay unbeaten you know I think it was just a little bit too hard I mean they had one loss story against Watford but um, you know it, it was too hard to keep that kind of momentum going after they, they'd won the title Bob what was surprising Bob was two uncharacteristic mistakes by, by Liverpool's most reliable players yeah that's the irony isn't it the world's most expensive defender and the world's expensive, most expensive goalkeeper at the time. Both make howlers. Um, yeah, you couldn't have seen that coming. But I think it's probably a reflection that Liverpool have lost their edge. I mean, teams don't really go for records. They go for trophies. And once the trophy was clinched, the, the idea of getting 100 points was nice. I mean, I'm certainly agreeing that they, they were playing for it, but they weren't going quite as hard as they would have been, say, if the title had been still at stake. I think this is just human beings, you know, they, they are human after all. It's psychology. Um, you can't expect them after a disrupted season. I mean, the season has been mucked up, hasn't it? I think if they'd carried on, they probably would have had a better chance of doing it. But this has been a major disruption to the season. I mean, I know it's the same for everybody, but when you're targeting a specific goal like that, which is still a pretty tall order, you're going to fall a little bit short. Yeah. Um, even when you've achieved your main goal, which was the title after all. So I think it's forgivable. I don't think Jurgen Klopp is going to be losing any leap over it. I, I think Rio Ferdinand actually pointed out that uh, despite winning the title and, and despite having high standards at United, one players do drop that one or two percent. You do go out for that beer midweek, you know what I mean, where you may not have done, uh, but it does happen. Keish, well, what about that, this Russell, Arsenal uh, under Arteta? Um, will they be challenging next season, do you reckon? I think it all boils down to what they get done in the transfer market. I think uh, there was a really strong statement from Arteta in the post-game interview where he said that uh, as happy as he was with the performance of his player and sort of like the determination shown by his player, but there was a you know there's a bit of this like concern from the fact that um, 
the coronavirus situation might hamper um, the amount of money that Arsenal would have uh, at, at their disposal to spend in the summer. Because he pointed out and said that, look, uh, if you want to improve the squad, you need far better players. And I don't think anyone who have watched Arsenal in the last few weeks would disagree with that. That entire backline needs an overhaul. They could. I, I was looking at their game uh, a couple of weeks ago and I was thinking to myself, that's a back three of Kolasinac, David Lewis and Mustafi. How far can you go with that? <laughs> you know, so th- there has to be an overhaul. Um, he's, got, he's got right pieces here and there. And obviously, players like Bukayo Saka signing new long-term contracts. Uh, Reese Nelson looked good against Liverpool yeah. as well. Uh, Maitland Isles has been uh, pretty brilliant for us all, uh, in patches this year. So, I think he's got bits and pieces of, of talent and ability in his squad. But there's obviously you know overhaul that needs to be done in certain departments, especially the defence. And as long as they aren't able to do that, then it will always be a problem for Arsenal. If they can get it done, and I agree with Craig, I think there is a pattern to what Arsenal are trying to do at the moment. If they can get their business done right in the summer, I mean not the summer essentially, but uh, if they can get yeah, their business in the done window, right in the window, yeah, in the window, then it's perfect. Then you have it. Probably not an Arsenal side that will challenge for the title, but an Arsenal side that will now consistently be pushing for a top four, which is probably what Ateta just wants at the moment. Not yep. the title, but just consistently challenge the big boys at the top. Okay. Should also mention, Emi Martinez in an Arsenal goal is in inspired form. Um, all right, let's move on. Bob, Man City 2, Bournemouth 1. Um, let's skip the game a little bit for now, because this was City's first game since their ban was overturned by Cass. Now, without going too much into detail, do you reckon financial fair play is dead in the water because of this decision? Yes, I, I think it is uh, pretty well. Uh, I mean, the leagues, the individual leagues, even the uh, football league uh, in England is still trying to maintain it. And they may well do so. But for the big boys, no. It won't, um, I mean, this is it. This is the death knell. I mean, uh, they exceeded their spending. They were guilty of a lot of those offenses. They got off them because they were time barred. So they were technic, they got off on a technicality in several cases and they still got fined a third of the amount. So they, um, although they were, exonerated and you can say that they won the case the um there was still an element of cheating about it everybody knows that and it shows they they got away with it i mean they go to the highest court in europe and they get away with it because they had better lawyers because the uh, uefa botched it uh and uh they can, they're free to carry on spending, basically. And so are all the other big boys. I mean, Jurgen Klopp said that. I mean, it wasn't sour grapes. I mean, he said, look, we could end up with a league of 10 teams, a world yeah. league of 10 teams. Super league. If we're not careful. And, and this is the way it's heading. Um, and this is a big step towards that. So it, I think it was a disastrous result for football. Okay. Um, it was 2-1 to, to City, Craig. The Cherries, I thought, showed a lot of fight, but they really needed a result. VAR denied them a, a goal. Um, they're all but down. I mean, too little, too late. Yeah, um, I, I think we saw this um, a few weeks ago, really. I mean, you know, I've said you know, the bottom three would be the bottom three for a while now, despite, you know, Villa, Villa winning last week or last game week. Um, you know, I just, I, I just don't see it. You know, you look on, on paper, Bournemouth have, you know, great squad in terms of names, but some of those players haven't really produced for, for Eddie Howe this season. And, um, and you, you look into this match, you can't say that they didn't give it their all. I mean, this was a match they actually, I, I thought they played well. You know, they deserved probably more uh, than, than, what, than what they got out of it, especially in the last 10, 15 minutes. You know, they really pushed City back. Um, they really made... City, you know, work for that win and, and, and kind of defend and hang on a little bit. Um, I, I, I thought if they play with that kind of intensity, you know, for, for, for most of the season, you know, they, they, they would be all right. So, yeah. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's a shame, really, you know, because I think over the years we, we praised Eddie Howe, we praised Bournemouth. Um, we've actually seen them spend money 
you know, for a small club. Don't forget, the stadium's only holding about ten to 13,000 or something like that. It's ridiculously small. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and for a club to, you know, go out and, and spend 20 million, 30 million on, on plays, you know, it's, it's a lot of money for them. Um, the sad thing about this is, you know, the championship is not an easy place to, to bounce straight back up. And you feel the football almost, don't you? I do. You know, you, over the last few years, we've seen, you know, a couple of teams, Sunderland. They don't look like know, a Euro side, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, like once they go down to the championship, you know, they struggle to get out and they drop even lower. Yeah. You know, I... I mean, I don't. I think Bournemouth are well run um, to, to to prevent something like that from happening. But you know, once you get down to the Championship, it's tough, and there'll be a lot of, of clubs looking at their players. You know, your David Brooks, your Callum Wilsons, mm -hmm. Nathan Ake. Um, they've got some good good talent there. So uh, yeah, I do I do fear for Bournemouth slightly, um, uh, but I just hope that Eddie Howe you know, keeps his job because of the remarkable job that he's done there. Yep. Yep, same here. Uh, they became the first team to outshoot Man City at home, 14 to 8. First team since 2016. No mean feat. Uh, all right, Kish, uh, Crystal Palace nil, Man United 2, 19 games unbeaten. That's what you said at the start. I, I, I take it you stayed up and watched the game. Uh, Anthony Martial playing with a smile on his face these days. Didn't recognize him. <laughs> Yeah, he looks like a complete a rejuvenated character, doesn't he? Um, it was, I, I thought, you, you see, the, the one thing that, as far as United have been dominant after the restart, the one thing that has been a, a common theme in a lot of these games is their inability to start games on the front foot. And I thought that was uh, once again at display mm. against uh, Palace. I thought United started really poorly. The first 45 minutes was really dodgy, actually. And in some portions, it looked a lot more trickier than it was even against Southampton, for that matter. I thought Palace were, were, were really pushing United uh, and, and, and it, it really looked like at some point that United sort of lacked um, you know, the, the, the outlet to be able to break this Palace defence down. And I think it also didn't help that they, did, you know, they, they didn't have Brandon Williams and Luke Shaw at left back, which has been like, a, you know, both players have been a revelation for United, not just defensively, but offensively as well. Um, Fosu Mensa, I mean, sure, he was, you know, dependable at the back, but he didn't offer what, you know, those two players offered going forward. But um, the, the moment Rashford broke the deadlock just before halftime, I think that there's no better time to score a goal than just before halftime because it completely disrupts the opposition team. And that's exactly what it did. Second half, Palace could have, could have come back. Uh, but, uh, it, I mean, again, we could spend an entire episode talking about VAR, I'm pretty sure. Yep. I, I really don't want to dive into that, but uh, it's the same old thing again. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. held on. And um, Anthony Marshall, yeah, every single time Rashford gets a goal, Marshall responds with the other goal. And that's the most exciting part about this United's, uh, United's attack at the moment because everyone is sort of just driving and pushing each other. Bob, Bob, ha has there ever been a, a doctor uh, heading the, the England attack? Ever. Because Dr. Rashford... Is... Yes, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's yeah, some achievement for a 22-year-old, right? It is, it is, yeah. But, you know, um, he, he only got one assist, I think, but he had a hand in uh, both goals. And, Bruno and there's, a partnership, there's a partnership forming with him and Marshall. You can see that in the last two games as well. Yeah, yeah. But to me... Uh, Bruno Fernandes has been the player of the second half of the season. Had they had him at the start, uh, you, you do wonder what United could have achieved. They certainly would have been in the top four. Um, I don't think they would have pushed for the title, but they're a different team. I mean, he's made a difference to four or five players in that team. You've not only had himself, who's a great player, and he scores goals. He's got quite a few goals in in him for a relatively cre and more creative midfielder than um, normal. Um, but he's ignited other players. I mean, Martial being a classic example, Rashford, and even Pogba. I mean, Pogba is now talking about signing another contract. Now, that's partly down to economics, partly because nobody is willing to pay the hundred and odd million United want for him. But it's also partly down to Bruno Fernandes who he sees as a, as a player of similar caliber and he can make this team tick. Mm -hmm. And Pogba's realizing that if I do have to stay here, I can actually win something. So 
what a signing, really, what a signing, whether it was Ed Woodward or Oli Gunasowska, I don't know, but somebody deserves a lot of credit for, for that. It, first, it's been absolutely transformative. Yep, first Man United player to win two Player of the Month awards since Cristiano Ronaldo, no less. Um, all right, crucial win for, for United that, Craig. They needed to go level on points. They stay in fifth. They level on points with Leicester. Leicester have been nervy since the re, uh, restart, but they had a good win. They, they beat Sheffield United 2-0. Two, two it's, it's coming down to this head-to-head on the final day of the season, right? For that final spot, it looks like. Yeah, it will. Um, it, it will definitely come down. And, and, you know, even with Chelsea, you know, it's, it's, it's all there to play for in the last two games. Um, you know, Leicester's win was, was really good because they really needed to win that ahead of, uh, I think they got Spurs and then United in, their, in the last two games. So that's really, you know, it's not easy games for them. So they needed to get three points on the board here. It was a good performance. I thought Sheffield United were poor. It's not the Sheffield United that we've seen this season. Um, um, with, with, with Leicester, you, you just feel at the moment they're blowing a little bit hot and cold. You know, you don't know which Leicester side is going to turn up. You know, we've seen, I mean, even the other night uh, against Bournemouth, you know, we saw a good first half and a shambolic second half. Um, and with Brendan Rodgers, it's, it's, you know, the record uh, for Leicester in, in 2019 hasn't been great. You know, yeah. they, they really suffered to just try and string wins together. Um, it looked like they were all set. You know, it looked like the top three were confirmed you know, coming, uh, coming out of this lockdown. You know, no one really gave Chelsea and United um, a, a chance of... of well, they've, they've at least close. guaranteed the Europa League spot with that win. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it's still a successful season, whichever way you want to look at it. You know, Leicester will, will finish the season in the Europe, if they do finish in the Europa League. You know, it, it'll still be a good season for them get, to get into Europe. But, you know, the dizzy heights that they got off, off to third uh, and the football that they were playing in the, in the first half of the season, you know, we were commending them. We we're saying Brendan Rodgers had done a fantastic job praising individual players, you know, Soyun Chu and, and, you know, Vardy and, and Madison. But it's kind of come unstuck, you know, in, in 2020. Mm. Um, and, and, and post-lockdown, you know, you're seeing a really patchy, inconsistent performances from Leicester. We've seen the good, like, um, you know, that we saw yesterday. We've seen the bad, the second half at, at Bournemouth. Um, so, so... You know, coming into the last two two games, if you're asking me to predict what kind of Leicester side is going to turn up for it, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. You know, it could be absolutely horrible against Spurs, who, who know how to grind out wins now under Mourinho. Don't have to be, be playing fantastic football. Um, or it could be a fantastic, sublime Brendan Rodgers, uh, you know, beautiful po- football performance that, that will see them seal the Champions League. Mm. Either way, it's going to be fascinating because, you know, as I mentioned, Chelsea are still in the mix as well. Yeah. It's three teams chasing for that third and fourth place. Chelsea have uh, Liverpool and Wolves in their next two games. United have West Ham and Leicester. Yeah. So it, it's fascinating. It really is going into it. And it's going to be the side that, that's going to be the most consistent, the one that can, can you know, grind out results. It's not going to be easy, but it's all about the results, not the performances at this stage. Mm. All right, let's look at some of the other match week 36 results. And as Craig mentioned, Chelsea won mm-hmm. Norwich nil. Um, Kish, it was Giroud with the goal. Lampard said uh, after the match, he still wants more from his side. But for me, Frankie Lampard is, is in with a shout for manager of the season. Don't forget he had a transfer ban, etc., 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 right? Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm, I mean, obviously, to me at least, they are far better candidates. Uh, not far better, but they are you know, better names like your Chris Wilders. Uh, even Nuno Espirito has done a great job at Wolves. Um, even, even that Klopp Klopp guy up in yeah, the, even the yeah. club guy. Yeah, even the club guy. Yeah, obvious favorite. But but yeah, Lampard, Lampard has been brilliant. Uh, I think if you speak to a lot of Chelsea fans, if you tell them that um, they'll be right in with a shot for Champions League qualifications at the end of the season when they've lost their best player in Eden Hazard uh, and, and, and they've lost a manager and they've brought in a young manager who has only managed in the championship. Um, no doubt he's a club legend, but you know, inexperienced still at this point. But what Chelsea have done under Lampard this year has been brilliant. It's been refreshing as well because he sort of injected this youth um, uh, uh, you know, ability into this Chelsea side. Uh, it, they've always been recognised as a buying club over the last decade or so at least. So I think for the fans to be able to see the likes of Mason Mount, Timmy Abraham, 
a loftus cheek uh, playing more regularly on, on and, and it's just been exciting for them mm. i think uh, the bigger problem for lampard will start after the season obviously all focus is geared towards um, you know champions league qualification at this point but the bigger problem for lampard is what he does to improve that defense because that has been pretty dodgy for him uh, throughout the season christensen kurt zuma rudiger they've not exactly looked very solid Aspilicueta is aging on the right back position yeah. as well. Left back. Uh, so yeah, left back. Uh, Marcos Alonso has just been, you know, substandard. He's not there. really a left back, Alonso. Yeah, he's more <laughs> of a wing back, right? Yeah. So there's a bit of concern in that, and I think uh, the other bit that we saw from Norwich, uh, and I just want to talk a little bit about Olivier Giroud, because um, he he's been on really good form at the moment, uh, and I think it's largely down to the fact that Chelsea are realizing that he becomes significantly important when they play against sides that defend deep. Now, this is the same problem the United had very early in the season, if you remember, against teams that pressed them really highly. United had the pace to be able to exploit them and score goals. Chelsea, no problem. Any of the top six sides, no problem. Rashford, Marshall run, will run right against them. But what happens when you play the likes of Burnley, who sit deep? Yeah. The likes of you know, any other team that just is, is a bit more conservative. You need that target man up front. Okay. And Chelsea's problem against Sheffield United was they, you know, they, they played players like Tammy Abraham, who isn't exactly a target man. But every single time they play Giroud, he holds the ball, he brings your Christian Pulisic into the side. Uh, and Pulisic is a player who, who loves cutting in, loves um, trying his luck. So I think there's space. As much as there were rumours for Giroud to leave in January, I really think there's space for Giroud in this Chelsea team under uh, Frank Lampard, even if it's a bit part role, but there's a significant role that he can still play um, in, in the coming season. And it's been great. It's been great to see Olivier Giroud back on the score sheet regularly. Yep. All right. Uh, Newcastle 1, Spurs 3. Uh, Bob, after the game, Jose Mourinho praised incredible Harry Kane. He's now got 201 goals in 350 games. Uh, all but 16, they have been scored for Tottenham. Um, Jose also said that they'd be top four if he started, if he was there to start the season. But uh, end of the season time, Jose, uh, it's squeaky bum time. And he knows how to play his team, doesn't he? He uh, certainly does. And uh, he's correct, you know, uh, with that assertion, believe it or not, uh, only three teams have more points than uh, Spurs since he took over and Craig what a week or so ago I doubted Craig's uh, stat about that but it's um it's improved I think you said there were four Craig now there's only three so definitely would have been Champions League for Spurs <laughs> this season um it's amazing because it doesn't seem as if he's done very well does it yeah. I mean there have been wrangles between players even on the pitch you know players jumping into the stands, uh, flouting the, the lockdown rules off the field. You know, it seemed like a club in some disarray. And throughout, Mourinho has been moaning. So to, to discover, and I think it is a discovery for most people, that he's actually got the fourth best record in the league is really quite something. And I think it's um, a reflection of how we kind of have underrated him. We almost feel that he's now yesterday's man. But actually, he's still getting a tune out of players, despite everything. Mm. So the outlook for Spurs um, is not as bad as it seemed uh, when the lockdown resumed. And uh, they've got a, well, they've got a mathematical chance of fourth place, but I think it's on. I think it's unlikely. Um, they're going to be in Europe anyway next season. I think that's. Um, I think they've got a very good chance of being in the Europa League. And of course, as Mourinho never ceases to remind us, he's won it twice. <laughs> he's only been in it twice, and he's won it twice. So he's going for. A, he will be going for a hat trick. Uh, Harry Kane. Yeah. What else? What else can you say about him? He looks a bit sluggish when he first came back after lockdown, but that's understandable. He hadn't played for about eight months. Um, he was a bit rusty, but he's got a couple of goals now. And yeah, you can see the quality in the man. All right. Elsewhere, Burnley won, Wolves won. A superb strike from Raul Jimenez and a last-minute equaliser from Chris Wood. 
Um, Everton won, Aston Villa won. Villa will probably now have to win their final two matches against Arsenal and West Ham. If, that's a big if, if they're going to survive. Uh, Southampton won, Brighton won. The Saints avoid, what, 11 home defeats in a season. Uh, and that's pretty much uh, match week 36. Only one more game to play. That's West Ham against Watford, 3 a.m. Saturday morning kick off that one. So that's what the table looks like at the moment. It's all go at the top. The top four chase is very exciting, as, in, as is the uh, uh, battle to avoid relegation at the bottom. It is the FA Cup semi-final weekend. Two games, both played at Wembley. Uh, there'll be fans packing up Wembley, normally. But yeah, both behind closed doors. Uh, Arsenal versus Man City is a Sunday 2.45 a.m. kickoff. Craig, if we, if we look at Man City's last game, you could probably suggest that Pep has an eye on this one because of the formation he put out, right, in, in the league game. And and it's you know City he's 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 a serial winner he he wants a trophy this is their one step away from the final here right yeah uh, if you look at the team selection um, against Bournemouth um, I mean you would expect the likes of Kevin De Bruyne Raheem Sterling uh, to start that match uh, probably Mendy as well yeah um, and and if you if you look at the build up to this you know. Uh, what what he's done is he's rotated his players a bit, and this is the one. You know, for him being at City, they can't finish empty-handed. Uh, I think that's the big thing. You know, they've got a lot of uh, criticism for the fact that they finished so far behind Liverpool, um, and, and Pep will have to make that up. Now, let's not forget they still got the FA Cup to to compete for. They're still in with a good chance in the Champions League. You know, it's a it, it's a it's a tall order, but. You know, they still got the tools to win that. Let's not forget. And that is the one, the one trophy that Man City and Pep won. So, I mean, if he were to come out of that with, with an FA Cup win and, and a Champions League win, I mean, I don't think anyone will be looking at Pep and, and City as they are now and saying, well, you know, you did finish 20 points behind Liverpool or whatever it is. 11 you know, so, so in the season as well. Yeah, I mean, I mean that, that is the one stat, I think, that, you know, that people will look at Pep and say, you know, what's going on here? I mean, they've yeah. got more losses than Man United, <laughs> you know, but all the criticism that United have had. And, Pep will and just Ole blame John that. Stones, won't he? <laughs> well, I mean, he could, he, he could blame quite a few. <laughs> he could blame quite a few at the back, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, but, but you know, it, you look at games and, you know, you just go back recently to the Southampton game and, and how they lost that one. Yeah. You know, they, they've actually dominated that whole yeah, match yeah. and somehow have failed to score. But just looking ahead to, to, to this, you know, it's going to be a great match uh, with, with them uh, and Arsenal. You know, it, it really is because they, I mean, with, with City, it, it's the fact that they have to go out and win something. They're going to play a strong squad. There's no two ways about it. Um, I, I do think City are playing some fantastic football right now. Um, but then on the flip side of that, you see a rejuvenated Arsenal. You know, I, um, they, they also made their own um, uh, tactical or, or the rested a lot of players um, in anticipation for this semi-final. So, so Arteta definitely has his eye on the trophy as well. You, know, you look at the likes of Oba, who was on the bench, Ceballos, um, who, who was also benched. You look at the back three. Um, so, so, you know, Klasnec and everything did, did, didn't start. So he has rested his, his key players as well. So, you know, it's, it's not the same Arsenal side that we saw six months ago. You know, it's a new Arsenal side. Um, there's a bit of confidence oozing about them. Um, especially after the win against the champions a few days ago. So this is going to be a lot closer than you think. Keith, if you're Arteta, how, how are you going to go about winning this one? Because this will be a massive notch, uh, do you know what I mean? Uh, on, the, on the bedpost, if you like. Uh. <laughs> See, that's the problem, Ross. It doesn't matter what Arteta wants to do with his Arsenal side. So as long as he has David Luiz, Mustafi and Kalesna to the back, Things can get out of hand really, really quickly for <laughs> Arsenal. Like we've seen, we've seen that happen so many times since the recent. Zero to a hundred. <laughs> yeah, it's just oh my god, it's such disastrous defending at times, and it gets ridiculous. And I think there's two. See, 
there's too much of onus being placed on Obamayang to be the creative fulcrum of the team at the moment. Um, we, we watched the game, uh, the North London derby. When Bukayo Saka doesn't play immediately, they look short of creativity. Uh, and, and everything is just piled on Obama Young to be that guy who drops deep to influence play. But at the same time, you're sort of depending on him to be the goal scorer as well. Now, as much as I, I applaud the, their performance against Liverpool, as much as I think it's a legitimate win and deserves to be credited legitimately as well, but like the conversation we had earlier in the show, um, Liverpool were on the beach already. But this city side will not be on the beach. If anything, yeah. they will be relentless. Um, and that's the difficult side. Uh, as much as I admire Ateta and the work that he's done in Arsenal, and I think um, Arsenal, he's shown enough for the board to back him for a prolonged period. He needs reinforcements. And I have absolutely no doubt that if he's given the right amount of support, this Arsenal side will evolve into a much better team next season and the season after that. But right here, right now, do I think they have the ability to beat City uh, this weekend? I would be very, very surprised if they pull off an upset. Because as far as I, I'm looking at this, I'm looking at Raheem Sterling. I'm looking at Gabriel Jesus. I'm looking at players like uh, Kevin De Bruyne. I'm looking at players like, uh, 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 what do you call that? Ilkay Gundogan. Every single one of these guys running against David Lewis and Mustafi. And something yeah. about that just makes me feel deeply, deeply uncomfortable, honestly. I, already you saying that made me a little scared. Yeah. <laughs> Ars- 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 the are widening. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Against Arsenal. <laughs> Arsenal, Man City then. Sunday, 2.45 a.m. kickoff. Uh, Bob, Man United take on Chelsea. Uh, 1 a.m. on Monday, this one. Um, Chelsea, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer brought up, have had 40, or will have had, 48 hours more rest than Man United. That's a bit unfair in the scheduling, isn't it? Uh, it is, but um, it's bound to happen. Um, they're not the only ones who've experienced this. I mean, when you're trying to cram all these games in to a, a, a sort of trying to get a quart into a pint pot, as it were, um, this is inevitable. And uh, you just got to put up with it. They agreed to it, I mean, in the first place. Uh, so get on with it. Um, I hope that's not him getting his excuses in early, because has it, has, uh, has I think it got the United, makings? Has it got the makings of an exciting semi-final for you this this time? It does. It does have. Yeah, goals. I think it's a great pity. I mean, um, for both games, both semi-finals, it's a great pity there won't be any fans there because you've got four out of the top six or seven clubs mm. in the country uh, dicing for the chance to play in the final, and great shame. Uh, I mean, it could be a London derby, the final, or it could be a Manchester derby. Either way, or even if it's not, um, it, it could be a cracking game, um, the final, and, and both semi-finals. I mean, it's mm. a real feast of football there. Yeah. Um, and I think everybody should really be out to win it. The only thing that worries me is that with the second game, Manchester United and Chelsea, there's... A, both teams have got important midweek fixtures coming up in the league. And the question is, will they be at full strength? Now, you'd think for an FA Cup semi-final, that's a no-brainer. Of course, they'd be at full strength. But the Champions League is more important than winning the FA Cup now. That's, that's quite a good point. Yeah. So, you know, and they're guaranteed a place in the Europa League uh, if they win the FA Cup. But uh, Champions League is what it's all about. Mm. And I, I just hope that those two young managers who've both enjoyed FA Cup final success, Lampard and Solskjaer, they know what it's like to win the FA Cup. And I just hope they treat the competition with respect and put out their four sides. But you'll know why. If there's anybody, the star player on the bench, you'll know why. Okay, um, there are three Match Week 37 matches uh, happening over the weekend as well. As Bob mentioned, the rest throughout the week. Uh, Norwich are playing Burnley Sunday, half past midnight kickoff, that one. Um, yeah, we know about Norwich. <laughs> Burnley, it's, it's a free-for-all, I reckon. Depends, maybe they're at the beach as well. Who knows? Bournemouth versus Southampton. Well, Bournemouth really, really have to win that. And Southampton, they're, they're, they're made of stronger stuff these days. Uh, Spurs-Leicester, Craig, is it, the one we should have a little chat about because this one 
is massive for European sports. Leicester almost in a must win. Yeah, you, you'd think that they're in a must win situation with the fixtures that, that United have um, against West Ham and then, and then playing them um, as well as Chelsea, you know. Um, I, I just feel that, that Spurs are just, uh, as, as, as we spoke about earlier, you know, and Bob, Bob brought up that stat, you know, Mourinho has been going uh, along his business very quietly. I mean, it's not easy on the eye when you watch Spurs play. Um, you know, we, we talk about Harry Kane, and yes, he was injured for, for, for a large chunk of the season. When he came back into it, you know, there are question marks whether, you know, he fits into Mourinho's style and there are question marks about him. What I would say is that, yeah, he probably doesn't get um, involved in, uh, in the box as much as he does, which is why it, it may seem that. But um, I suppose maybe don't create as many chances as they did under Mourinho as they did under Pochettino. Mm. But they're effective. You know, they, they're, they're winning games, whether it's grinding them out, um, as we saw against Arsenal. Um, against Newcastle, it wasn't a great display, but it was enough to win by a two-goal margin. And, and you know, we Mourinho is no stranger to the league. You know, we've seen this year in, year out um, about effective football rather than, um, you know, eye-catching football. You know, it, for Mourinho, it's about getting the points on the board. It's about achieving targets rather than satisfying the fans who want beautiful football. So, you know, it, it comes back into that, that, that question of, you know, do, do I play good football or do, do we want success? Do we want to qualify for the Champions League? Uh, Mourinho will get you Champions League if you give him a season, I reckon. Mourinho's given um, up good football a long time ago. A long time ago. A long, long time ago. Time so, so, you know, go, going into this, um, I'm actually favouring Spurs. So okay. to, to come out of this, as I said, I think Leicester have been hot and cold. Um, I just can't predict what kind of Leicester performance I'm going to get out of this. Um, I, I think West Morgan has stepped in for, for Soyun Chu, as we saw over the weekend, who I think is going to miss the next two games. So, you know, that, that could be a factor that, that Harry Kane plays off. I thought, actually, West Morgan was actually pretty good yep. um, yesterday. Yep. But, you know, against Spurs, you know, he hasn't played a lot of football um, against the pace of Son, you know, someone like Harry Kane... Uh, facing him, um, I, I just, I just see a Spurs win here. Um, oh, well, yeah. Brendan Rodgers has said there'll be no Bell, Ben Chilwell, there'll be no James Madison, there'll yeah. be no Christian Fuchs uh, until yeah. the end of the season. They're, the young kid did pretty well yesterday. By yeah, the way. They're, they're all they're all out injured, so so that's something yeah. to think about. Spurs yeah. Leicester Sunday eleven o'clock is the ideal appetizer to the second FA Cup semi final between uh, Man United and Chelsea. So three Premier League matches from match week 37 happening over the weekend. Norwich versus Burnley, Bournemouth against Southampton and Spurs against Leicester City. Right, let's get some predictions from the chaps then. And we're going to start with you, Kish. What, what, which one? What were you going for? What are you going for? FA Cup? League game? Yeah, I'm going for the FA Cup game. Um, I'm looking at Man United, Chelsea. And um, look, I, this is not coming out of a position of bias. <laughs> as much as people will be inclined to think so. <laughs> but um, I, I, as much as I like, I admire Chelsea. But I think at this point, what separates, what truly separates Chelsea from Man United um, is stability at the back. And I know this comes as a bit of an irony given what we saw um, United against Southampton, some of the defensive mistakes at the back. But bottom line is United's defence is a lot more stable um, compared to what Chelsea have at the back at the moment, which is very penetrable, uh, can be penetrable too. And I think uh, United will be good value to get a win over Chelsea in the FA Cup semi-final. Okay, nice one. Uh, Bob Holmes, what's your big shout for the weekend? Uh, well, I agree with that, um, but can I have two games and predict a Manchester derby for the final? Ooh. I think United, I agree, I think United will beat Chelsea, and I'm uh, very confident that City will beat Arsenal. They beat them 5-0, you know, in the first <laughs> game back after lockdown. We've forgotten about that. It seems a long time ago, but it was 5-0 going on 10-0. Um, they absolutely overwhelmed Arsenal. Ten-man Arsenal. I, I, yeah. 
well for, yeah but still um i i don't i don't see any any danger to city from okay. uh, from arsenal all manchester final from bob uh, craig you are your big shout cannot be Man City. <laughs> oh, oh, man, <laughs> you were gonna, you were gonna choose that, weren't you, Craig? <laughs> yeah, I was, I was gonna say, yeah, Arsenal to win and David Luiz to score. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm actually gonna go. Uh, I'm gonna follow Bob's, uh, Bob's kind of thing and, and go for two matches here. So the first one that I'm gonna go for is um, since we're talking about the FA Cup semi, I'm actually gonna go for Chelsea to beat United. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Chelsea, I mean, United have looked very leggy in the last two games. Um, you know, I think on the high, you know, when they're coming up after lockdown. And, and one um, eye you know, will be on the league, won't it? That's... One eye will be on the league. Um, I, I'm not sure Ole changes it too much in, in terms of the team selection. I think your main plays will still play. Uh, but I just feel that, um, you know, the, the tightness, the fatigue is creeping up on the United plays. You know, I think when, when Ole plays... Um, in terms of counter-attacking football, and you know, it's it's using it's used up a lot of energy, um, and and, it, and I did kind of feel that that would come in at at some stage, uh, fatigue because they were playing football at a really impressive pace uh, post lockdown. Um, I feel watching you know the Southampton match and the um, uh, the match last night, um, I, I just feel um, that you know uh, you know there's a bit of fatigue in in the way that they're playing. So I'm actually going to tip Chelsea here. Um, and and, tell, and expect them to be united. Um, my other one is for Spurs to beat Leicester, as I said earlier. So okay. Spurs to beat Leicester and Chelsea to beat Man United in the FA Cup final. Uh, there, there you go. More than three big shouts for the weekend. That's uh, two, four, five big shouts for the weekend. Uh, <laughs> many thanks to, to Bob Holmes, to Craig Marias and, and to Kishnan. And uh, thank you guys for, for watching as well. We'll see you next week. Bye now.